O oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Amen. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath become his counselor? Or who hath first given to him that it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him alone be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We won't be turning to that verse, but I, I quoted that first because of the... Uh, the topic that we're going to be studying today in, in this class is, is the sovereignty of God. It's an enormous topic. Uh, I studied on it for a long time, uh, read about five books, read much scripture, listened to many sermons, and uh, my mind is filled, uh, my heart is filled with overflowing of thankfulness <laughs> of the opportunity to do this. I pray that the Lord blesses. Uh, I seek that the Lord will be glorified. I pray that the Lord will be glorified in this study and that you as the children of God would be edified and that saints or that sinners that would be terrified under the wrath of God, you abide. That song that I was going to choose, Brother John, was the perfect wisdom of our God. So uh, that worked out great. Praise the Lord. Amen. So I'll go ahead with my notes here, which I have 32 pages this time. No. <laughs> uh, all right. Yes, the perfect wisdom of our God revealed in all the universe, all things created by his hand and held together at his command. He knows the mysteries of the seas, the secrets of the stars are his. He guides the planets on their way and turns the earth through another day. <laughs> That's amazing. If I can keep it together here, uh, I'm just overwhelmed at, at this topic and, and God's goodness toward me and saving me, who was the chief of sinners. We won't be turning to any scriptures quite yet. I know that you like to do that. You're hungry to turn to scriptures. You got your fingers ready and you, they're all warmed up. So just give me a few, few minutes of introductory thoughts that uh, will get us in that right direction, and then we'll turn to some scriptures. Psalm 145, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Job 5, 9, which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. In this particular verse, uh, John Gill lends a helping hand here. Uh, he says that the things of creation are great things. The making of the heavens and the earth and all that is therein. By the word of the Almighty, out of nothing, and which a display of great power and wisdom and goodness, the things of providence are great things, which God is always doing as the upholding of all things by the word of his power. That includes gravity. If God were to, uh, let's say uh, we had uh, a God who is not like our God, uh, we would think, well, if God turns away, the sun may drop out of the sky. The, the stars may fall to the earth. You know, uh, our God is a sovereign God, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. That all is without exception. We sit or stand because God upholds us. Our hearts beat and we take the next breath because God upholds us. Our God is sovereign. And this message is the sovereignty of God absolutely. Now, it's such a big topic, I won't be able to cover all, all the nuances and, and areas that God is sovereign. Uh, but this, this is going to be like an introductory uh, doctrine uh, and a basis for a series of messages or uh, classes that I may give, if the Lord wills and the elder permits, uh, on the doctrines of grace. And it is my understanding that in order to understand the doctrines of grace, you must have an understanding of the sovereignty of God. And so, upholding all things by the word of his power, governing the whole universe, ordering all events in it, 
supplying and feeding all creatures, men and beasts, and especially the things of grace are great things. The covenant of grace and its blessings, redemption by Jesus Christ, the work of grace upon the heart, the quickening and enlightening, dead and dark sinners, taking away the flesh, taking away their hearts of stone and giving them hearts of flesh, and constantly supplying them with his grace for the finishing of it. Enabling grace. The grace that causes us to persevere into the end. God gives us enabling grace. And in other instances, his grace is sufficient for us. All his grace. The consideration of all, which is a great encouragement to seek the Lord in time of need, as well as what follows concerning them. End quote by John. In the book of Ecclesiastes says that the words of the wise are like nails the carpenter uses to fasten things together. Or the words of, wa of the wise are like a goad the farmer uses to move the animals along. And so is the word of God. Sp Charles Spurgeon had said, when providences are dark and it is difficult to read them, it is the word of God that tells us how to view them. So in all things we should say, what does God say? What is God doing? Search the scriptures, for it tells us what he's doing in all things. I believe that the word of God questions every answer and answers every question. Now in some ways not so uh, clear, like we could say, well, uh, what about this, that, or the other? And I might say, well, uh, in Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things that are revealed belong to us and to our children. So there are secret things that belong to the Lord, and the, and the Bible talks about those secret things, but it doesn't quite reveal them, but it lets us know that they are being revealed as providence is being worked out. These are the secret things of God. The Puritans used to use two wills of God in order to explain the will of God. They would talk about the revealed will of God, which is the scriptures, and they would also talk about the secret will of God, his providence as it is worked out, as day goes by, moment by moment, hour by hour. That particular uh, verse uh, talks about uh, the nails which fast the carpenter uses to fasten things together. Uh, I memorized that years ago, and it, and it was just there, and I'm not even sure what translation that was. But it's quite clear there that uh, the words of God are, are a guide uh, to all things that we do and say. should be to the glory of God. So, brethren, let us be encouraged to rightly use God's word as a lamp unto our feet, and a light unto our path. As we walk in God, by God's enabling grace in this crooked and perverse generation, we need the guidance of God and the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us through His Word. The term sovereignty conveys the supreme authority of God. While providence flows naturally from it, out of the working of God's plan for all creation. Let me move back up here. I lost my notes just a hair. It's, uh, our topic today is the sovereignty of God. Now at this point I would like to say that the providence of God is the outworking of his sovereignty. I thought about that and I thought, where did I get that? Because I've read so much on this, on this topic and then I had to go to the providence of God to read some of that and then the decrees of God they're like things that are just twisted together and they use the same scriptures to teach those, those great doctrines, the decrees of God, the providence of God, the sovereignty of God. And so that particular phrase there, uh, there's a lot of things that I've read and I can't quite give credit to who, who said them because they're just there and I didn't, I read a lot, you know, so it's, it's there. And I, I take no credit for it. God is the author of all. Uh, things and uh, I just give him the glory that I'm able to even speak in these terms. So the term sovereignty conveys the supreme authority of God while providence flows naturally from it as the outworking of God's plan for all creation. John Murray in his book Behind a Frowning Providence 
That's a great book. You can get that, uh, whether Banner of Truth and Trust or uh, Mount Zion Ministries also. Uh, says that God planned everything for his creation, and because he is the sovereign God, everything will come to pass as he purposed it. And he will be glorified in all his works. That's all without exception. All God's works are known unto him from the foundation of the world. All of them. And he's working all of them together for the Christian's good, for your good. All things, without exception. Now that word all things is an interesting word. It's intrigued me when I first learned this years ago about the word all. It's just a three-letter word, but it means a lot, and it can help us interpret the scriptures if we have just a little bit of light shed upon what it means. And we can break the word all down into two categories, all without exception or all with distinction. If we have a missing window there, and I say that I'm going to clean all the windows, I mean all the windows with distinction, because just all the windows that are there. But if I say all the windows are there, and if I say I'm gonna clean all the windows, well that means I'm gonna clean all the windows without exception. So in, 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 uh, in the Gospels, there's a time where uh, John was baptizing, and all of Jerusalem came down to be baptized by him. Now we know that the Pharisees weren't baptized by him, and we know that not every man, woman, and child was baptized by him. If you read the scriptures, you would know that. But that's, that's a, 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 a way to interpret a lot of scriptures. Well, is it speaking of all without exception or all with distinction? And we'd go to uh, scriptures that say God works all things after the counsel of his own will. That all is without exception. God is completely sovereign over all things. Now, at, the, at this point, and I probably should have said it at the outset, is the sovereignty of God does not, take away the responsibility of man. And th there's a mystery there. When, when we speak about the sovereignty of God, we must always remember that there is the responsibility of man. We can say, and we believe, that God is 100% responsible. But at the same time, we can believe that man is 100% responsible. Did I say responsible? God is 100% sovereign, and we are 100% responsible. So, knowing the sovereignty of God and meditating upon the sovereignty of God will increase our worship of God. And the other parts of Scripture, we have a mandate to preach the gospel to all creatures. So the hyper-Calvinist is something that we don't want to lean toward, nor we do we not want to lean to Arminianism. We want to walk the line as a Baptist should, a historical Baptist who believes in the doctrines of grace and the sovereignty of God. The word sovereignty can be defined as royal power or dominion. Let's turn to Psalm 103, verse 19, please. The word sovereignty can be defined as royal power or dominion, as in Psalm 103, verse 19. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Absolutely sovereign over all. Now, we live in a democracy. We don't quite understand what it is to live under the rule of a kingdom, where... where uh, the king rules over all, and he's able to cut this one's head off and, and bring this one up and give him treasures. I mean, so we live in a democracy, so we don't quite understand. And even if we did have a king who ruled, we live in a fallen world, so that we wouldn't have a good, the understanding uh, of a real kingdom, in a sense. But, but we do have, have a, a, a limited amount of understanding of how it should work. The king rules, and he rules over all. This is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Blessed be the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, that is over all created things, over angels, good and bad, over men, righteous and wicked, over greatest of men, kings and princes of the earth, 
Good angels are subject to him. Devils tremble at him. Saints acknowledge him as their king. The wicked he rules with a rod of iron, and kings reign by him and are accountable to him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, let's turn to chapter 4, verse uh, Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. Excuse me. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. Through a lot of the books that I've read and sermons that I listen to on these, uh, there's certain scriptures that all these teachers and preachers have, have turned to. And this is one of the major ones. Also some in Isaiah we're going to get to. And then also in James. At the end, at verse 34, at 35. At the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing compared to him, reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. None can stay his hand or say to him, what doest thou? Now in a cross-reference of that verse, we would, we would turn, don't turn, I'll just uh, quote it. It's like, shall the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? The man who's saved in a wheelchair, he's sitting in the wheelchair, why have you made me like this? The man being born, uh, was born blind from his birth. Did he say, why have you made me thus? In that particular instance, Jesus, they asked Jesus, well, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither, but that the glory of God would be seen. And Jesus healed him. So the, the man was born blind, and he lived all his life blind so that the glory of God could be seen, so that Jesus Christ could be exalted. And that's just one of the many illustrations, one of the many truths and examples that we have in the scriptures. And there are many that you yourselves could think of today, of the sovereignty of God in your life, or the life of your neighbor, or the life of your friend, coworkers, your boss. If we continue to meditate upon the sovereignty of God, Keeping in mind, we are responsible beings. Continue to meditate upon the sovereignty of God as we wake up in the morning, as we go along our day. There will be peace and comfort. Joy and peace in the Holy Ghost comes from meditating upon the scriptures and knowing that God is working all things together for our good. As I spoke before, uh, uh, it's a great book. It's a small book. Thomas Watson wrote it. It said, it's all things work together for good. And it, it's a good little book. I think it's on the uh, shelf out there. Excellent little book. So the sovereignty of God is the biblical teaching that all things are under God's rule and control. And nothing happens without his direction or permission. We know that uh, in the book of Job, Satan went before the Lord. And the Lord asked him, where have you been, Satan? Oh, running to and fro throughout the whole earth. You know, just doing this, that, and the other. So they're having this conversation. How do we not know, from that, from that scripture right there, how do we not know that that's happening right now? And perhaps Satan is talking about you to God. Oh, he only worships you because you... you Bless him, you know. Uh, uh, you only, he only worships you because you've given him the Holy Spirit, and, and he, he's enabled by your grace to do that, you know. But we don't know what God's and Satan's conversation is right now. We know that it happened with the book of Job. So perhaps. Perhaps your situation or your state of being right now is because Satan went before the Lord and talked about you. Perhaps. 
Ephesians 1.11. His purposes are all-inclusive. Of course, that's the uh, end part of it. God works not just some things, but all things according to the counsel of his own will. In Ephesians 1.11, it's having been predestinated by the purpose of God who works all things after the counsel of his own will. And that all, again, is without exception. God has a plan. He's had a plan before he created the world in the covenant of grace between him and the Son. The Trinity came up with the covenant of grace. The Father said to the Son, you, uh, these are people that I'm going to give to you. You're going to go down and do the work. You're going to die for them. And, and the whole plan of redemption was discussed before the world began in the mind of God. <laughs> That's amazing. You were thought of before the world began. And Christ said, yeah, I'll die for that one before the world began. And he came and he did it. Now, uh, a lot of the things that are coming to mind, uh, perhaps in your mind as well, is, is the uh, sovereignty of God and salvation. And if the Lord wills, I'll be speaking on uh, the doctrines of grace and we'll get in to how the Lord is sovereign in salvation. And the New Testament is full of that, as well as types and shadows of the Old Testament. If I don't get to my notes, though, I'll never get through. Uh, <laughs> okay, so God is not merely sovereign in principle, but he's sovereign in practice. What do we mean by the sovereignty of God? This is by Arthur Pink, out of the first chapter in, the, in his book, The Sovereignty of God. A good book. Uh, it's filled with a lot of scripture. I got one that every page is highlighted all over. <laughs> I couldn't quit highlighting. I bought a whole package of hi highlighters. But uh, that particular book, if you get it from Mount Zion, it has all the chapters that Arthur Pink intended to be in there. Other places, not so. So, excellent little book. And I, I took this part of his, his uh, description of the sovereignty of God. What do we mean by the sovereignty of God? We mean the supremacy of God, the kingship of God, the godhood of God. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that God is God. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the most high, doing according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth that none can stay his hand or sayest to him, what doest thou? Daniel 4.35, which we already turned to, to say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the almighty possessor of all power in heaven and earth so that none can defeat his counsels, thwart his purposes, or resist his will. Satan has a will as well but his will is subject to God's will. There's a scripture in 2 Timothy, and it talks about being the servant of the Lord must be patient and kind, able to teach, and ministering to others that perhaps God would grant them repentance that they may escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. That's interesting. That's, that's an interesting verse. So the people that you minister to, that you uh, evangelize out there, uh, co-workers, family, whoever we may evangelize, you, we could consider that it's possible this person is taken captive by Satan to do his will. But if you have the words of life abiding in you, whether it be in memory or, or your Bible there, as you evangelize, as you speak to people about the precious gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace, that can set a captive free. <laughs> to say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the governor among the nations, Psalm twenty-two twenty-eight, 28, setting up kingdoms, overthrowing empires, determining the course of the dynasties as, he ple his pleasing, as pleases him best. 
To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the only potent king of kings, lord of lords. Such is the God of the Bible. John Owen says, we do what we can. He does what he wills. And he never fails. In all our intentions, if the will defect be not an error of our own understandings, which may be rectified by better information. When we cannot do that which we would, we will do that which we can. The alteration of our purpose is for want of power to fulfill it, which impotency cannot be ascribed to the Almighty God, who is in heaven and hath done whatsoever he pleased. So we have a will, but that will is, isn't, uh, isn't powerful enough to determine. If I say that I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave and go home, uh, well, if the will, Lord wills, I will live and do this or that. And we'll get to that particular scripture in a while. So all our wills are subject to God's will, his governing powerful will, including Satan. The immutability of God's nature is his almighty power, the infallibility of his knowledge, his immunity from error in all his counsels, do show that he never faileth in accomplishing anything that he purposeth for the manifestation of his glory. End quote by John Owen. The dictionaries tell us that God, uh, that the sovereign means chief or highest, supreme in power, superior in position, independent of and unlimited by anyone else. Sounds like our great God to me. Furthermore, his sovereignty requires that he is absolutely free. Absolutely free. Which means simply that he must be free to do whatever he wills to do anywhere at any time to carry out his eternal purpose in every single detail without interference. Were he less than free, he must be less than sovereign. If God is not free in the dust and the atoms of the air, in all the molecules of creation, if there's one outside of his, his, his sovereign hand and his will, he's not sovereign at all. God is sovereign, absolutely sovereign, over all. All without exception. Grasping the idea of unqualified freedom requires vigorous effort of the mind. We are not psychologically conditioned to understand freedom except in its imperfect forms. Our concepts of it have been shaped in a world where no absolute freedom exists. Someone has even said that the birds are chained to the sky. Here each natural object is dependent upon many other objects, and that depends its limit, and that dependence limits its freedom. God is not dependent upon anything or anybody. He is absolutely free to do as he wills in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. None can stay his hand or say to him, what doest thou? God is said to be absolutely free because no one or no thing can hinder him or compel him to stop. He is able to do as he pleases, always, everywhere, forever. To be thus free means also that he must possess universal authority, and he does. That he has unlimited power, and he does. We know from the scriptures and may deduce from our certain other of his attributes that are all glorious. God is sovereign in all his attributes. He is infinitely sovereign. Subject to none, influenced by none, absolutely independent. God does as he pleases, only as he pleases, always as, as he pleases. None can thwart him or can hinder him. So his own word expressly declares, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46.10. You want to turn to scripture there with me? I have about 14 pages left. <laughs> huh. 
Isaiah 46.10 He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. None can stay his hand or say to him, What doest thou? Forgive me, my, my memory has gotten ahead of my notes. Divine sovereignty means that God is God in fact, as well as in name. He that he is on the throne of the universe, directing all things, working all things after the counsel of his own will. All things after the counsel of his own will, according to Ephesians 1.11 again. God's sovereignty over the works of his hands is clearly in all of Scripture. At his pleasure, the Red Sea divided, and its water stood up as walls in Exodus 14. And the earth opened her mouth, and guilty rebels went down alive into the pit. Numbers 14. When he so ordered, the sun stood still, Joshua 10. And on another occasion, went 10 degrees on the dial of Az, Isaiah 38, 8. To exemplify his sovereignty, he made ravens carry food to Elijah in 1 Kings 17. An axe head to swim on top of the waters, 1 King, 2 Kings 6.5. Lions to be tamed when Daniel was cast into their den. Fire to burn not when the three Hebrews were flung into its flames. Thus, whatsoever the Lord pleased, that he did in heaven and in the earth, in the seas and all their deep places. Psalm 135, verse 6. Now none should expect the unbeliever to embrace the doctrine of God's sovereignty. The Bible tells us that the spiritual man judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no man. That means no man who is unconverted has a spiritual understanding of spiritual things. We are called to look upon those things that are not seen, the spiritual things. For the things that are seen are temporary, but those things that are not seen are eternal. These are the things that we are called upon to see, and we see them in the scriptures. We see them played out in the actions of men in our brethren. God works all things. Perhaps no word expresses it more pointedly than the psalm. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalm 33, 6. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. This goes back to the first chapter of Genesis, where on some eight occasions, the successive steps of the creative drama were introduced with the truth, and God said. This is the same God who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Breathe, and we breathe. We'll get into that when we talk about irresistible grace an unconditional election, limited atonement. God made the heaven and the earth by his spirit. The heavens were garnished, and he laid the foundations of the earth. By wisdom he founded the earth. By understanding he established the heavens. His hand stretched out the heavens, and all their host he commanded. Heaven and earth his hand made. And so all things came to be. He made the sea and the dry land, according to Revelation. So we can say just now that we went from Genesis to Revelation in the sovereignty of God. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. Four of them do not involve fallen man. The first two before the fall, and the last two in the new heaven and new earth. And that's amazing. The rest are chronicles of sin and redemption, salvation, and God working it all together. We're going to close with Psalm 104. You can turn there and we'll read it together. I had seven pages left, but... <laughs> Okay, Psalm 104, verse 1. Bless, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. 
Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hastened away. They go up to the mountains, they go down to the valleys and to the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over. They, that they turn not again to cover the earth. We see the rainbow in the sky and that was the promise that God will not flood the earth again. So every time we see the rainbow, we know God's promises are sure. And he is faithful. He sendeth the springs into the valleys which run among the hills. They give a drink to every beast of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. Oh, how great is our sovereign God. It is he that causes the wind to blow and the waters to flow. We're speaking of hurricanes, tornadoes. You know, in the book of Job, uh, when, when the uh, messenger came to Job and said, uh, a great wind has came and it, uh, and it hit the four uh, pillars of the house where your, your sons and daughters were staying, and they are all dead. I am the only one that lived to come tell you. Well, it was Satan that caused that great wind because God gave Satan power to do what you will. Just don't take his life. But God's will was over Satan's will. Satan had permission to do what he did. And Satan has permission to do what he does. But he must have the permission of God to do it. God's will is sovereign. In respect of good and evil that sins of men come with the scope of this rule of providence, what asked the oppressed and the afflicted, Job? Smitten with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown, shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we re not receive evil? For with God, he says again, is wisdom and strength. He hath counsel and understanding. Behold, he breaketh down, and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man, and there can be no opening. Our God opens doors that no man can close, and he closes doors no man can open. Pris some, some prisoners take uh, great comfort in that. Because in prison, one of the biggest topics is parole. When am I going to get out? They're going to let me out. You know? But to the Christian who understands the sovereignty of God, parole is, un is subject to God. So when is God going to let me out? When, when he wants to, you know, be patient, wait a little while. Then came there unto him all his brother and all his sisters. This is in Job 42.11. And all his sisters and all that they had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one earring of gold and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him, the evil of afflictions of body and estate, which though by means of Satan and wicked men was according to the will of God and might be said to be brought on him and done by him by his Lord. God is sovereign over all things. Sickness, death, disease. In the book of Exodus, the ten plagues of, of Egypt, the flies, the frogs, everything God sent. God is sovereign over all things. The gnats that you see, the flies, what is the purpose of a fly? The secret things belong to the Lord our God. You know? <laughs> they do have a purpose. You know, the gnat that's bugging you all the time. <laughs> The secret things belong to the Lord our God. He is sovereign over that gnat. From the gnats to the elephants to the stars in the sky, God is sovereign. 
Father, I thank you, Lord, for the blessing of being able to speak.